It's no exaggeration to say <coughs> that the question of did uh, Lenin lead to Stalin is an incredibly important one for all of us. Uh, I think as soon as you say you're a socialist or you say you're a revolutionary or certainly a member uh, of the SWP, uh, one of the key questions that you always come up against, one of the first questions that people ask you is what about Russia? Uh, didn't everything go wrong in Russia? Didn't the revolution lead to Stalin, lead to a dictatorship, the gulag, and so on? And so we have to be confident in providing an argument against that, really, because what we're really told is that there was a straight line from October 1917 to the Stalinist regime that you see uh, at the end of the 1920s, in the 30s, the 40s, and so on. We're told that there was an inevitable procession, really, from... Uh, the Bolsheviks seizing power and the Soviets seizing power in October 1917, uh, that there was an in inevitable procession to the horrors that we saw uh, later on under Stalinism. Uh, people talked about it in the first session, but this is something that you learn in the history books. Uh, you know, this is something that the mainstream media are full of at the moment, <coughs> celebrating the centenary. This is something that even the exhibition at the Royal, Royal Academy of Arts puts forward, and so on. And basically, the the, the general uh, narrative, really, is that events in 1917 were going quite smoothly. Uh, the February <coughs> Revolution was a good thing. Uh, things were going quite smoothly. And then, really, the Bolsheviks hijacked it. Uh, and they launched a coup. They launched a premature revolution in October. And that if that hadn't happened, actually, uh, things would have gone uh, much, much, much smoothly and much better. Uh, in the SWP, we reject this analysis. Uh, we actually argue, as people have discussed earlier on today, we argue that the October Revolution was absolutely something we should celebrate. It was a high point in human history, and that actually the gains made during that revolution were reversed by a counter-revolution led by Stalin that came along later. Uh, so what I want to do in this session, really, is obviously start off a, a bit of a debate with everyone uh, and any questions people have, but what I want to do is I want to look at how it is uh, I, I, I want to look at how Stalin betrayed the October Revolution. I want to look at why this happened, and I want to talk a little <coughs> bit at, at the end about why this is relevant today. I guess the first question for us is, how, how is it uh, that we can be certain that Stalin uh, betrayed the ideals of 1917? How can we be certain that there's an absolute break between what Stalin represents and what the Bolsheviks fought for in the early days uh, of the revolution. I guess the place to start with that really is that a basic look uh, at the two regimes, at the, the two regimes, the, the Stalinist one from 1928 onwards and the Bolshevik <coughs> one uh, of, in the aftermath of 1917, a basic look shows that there's a stark difference between those two regimes and really, to put it simply, Stalin reverses any gains that are made uh, by the Bolsheviks. So, to look at a couple of examples of this, really, I want to look at the gains that were made and how Stalin reversed them. I think that the first one we can look at uh, is the gains that were made by women in the October Revolution. Because there's that famous quote by Trotsky, which says that if you want to see what any society is like, uh, look at it through the eyes of women. And if we look at the Bolshevik regime uh, of the aftermath of the revolution, uh, people have obviously talked about the way women led the revolution you know, in the demonstrations, in the strikes and so on. But what you see is that as soon as the, revol uh, the revolution takes place, the Bolsheviks make it one of their utmost priorities to have women's liberation at the forefront of the new society. So when the Soviets and the ordinary people of Russia are building the, the, the new society in the aftermath of the revolution, women's liberation is something that is absolutely at the heart of it. So not only do women get legal equality, so the right to divorce, uh, full voting rights, the right to abortion, and so on, but you see that the new regime, this, the Soviet regime, really tries to attack and undermine the material basis for women's oppression. So they do this by building communal kitchens, uh, providing communal childcare, communal laundrettes, and so on, in a real effort to get women out of the home and out of the isolation of being a housewife and a mother and so on, and so that they can play a real role in shaping the new society, in taking part in the big democratic <coughs> debates, taking part in the protests, the demonstrations, and so on. Now, if we compare that, if we compare women at the forefront of society in the early Bolshevik regime, if we compare that with what Stalin brings along later, 
you see that Stalin and the Stalinist regime make a real effort to get women back into the home. So because the, uh, the priorities of the new regime are not to uh, liberate or, or provide liberation or, you know, to encourage liberation for ordinary people, the priority of Stalinism is to build a society that can compete with the West. You know, the idea of socialism in one country, of industrialisation uh, on a rapid scale and so on. And so what that means is that rather than focusing on women's liberation, women go back to being seen as having a key role in really reproducing the next generation of workers. So Stalin, under Stalin, uh, awards are brought in for women who have the most number of children, because it is measured in terms of pr uh, you know, uh, uh, producing a new layer of workers. So you see that there's an absolute <coughs> reversal of the gains of 1917 by the Stalinist regime that comes later. Another good example of this uh, is in terms of sexual liberation and the liberation of LGBT people. Because after uh, the Russian Revolution, again, the Bolsheviks make a real commitment to ensuring that the sexual liberation, the liberation of LGBT people, is at the heart of the new society. So they uh, take out any uh, reference to sex acts in the criminal code, uh, they decriminalise homosexuality, uh, they decriminalise prostitution, and so on. And in general, a big effort is made to provide the circumstances where uh, LGBT people can fight off their oppression. Again, if we compare this to what, uh, what uh, life is like for LGBT people under, Stalinist, under, under Stalin's regime, you see that, again, because the family takes a central role under Stalinism, because everything is geared towards production and competition with the West, you see that uh, homosexuality <coughs> begins to become something that isn't just frowned upon again, but is also uh, made illegal as well. You see that the family becomes uh, a key uh, uh, unit under, under, in Stalinist Russia. So in 1930, uh, by, the time st by which time Stalin has risen to power, the Soviet encyclopedia references homosexuality as something that is unnatural and unlawful. So you see that again, that was made in 1917, again is reversed by Stalin. Uh, those are just two examples, but if you want to look at a comparison between the two regimes, there's a, there's a wealth of examples in terms of democracy, in terms of anti-Semitism, and so on. There's a wealth of examples about how Stalin really backtracked and betrayed many of the uh, gains of 1917. And I think what this shows is that the idea that there's a straight line between the two uh, can't really, it doesn't really make sense if you look at it on a basic level. The idea that there was a natural progression from 1917 <coughs> to uh, 1928 or, or later when Stalin comes to power, you see that actually this, this doesn't really hold water. Actually on a whole number of issues there's a key difference in, 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 in society. And that's why we talk about Star Stalin as leading a counter-revolution against 1917 rather than be as being the direct descendant of it. So I guess once it's clear that there's a fundamental break between Stalin and the society set up by Lenin and the Bolsheviks, I guess the next question that, that comes up is, why did this take place? How was it that Stalin and the apparatchiks around him, how were, they to rever how were they able to reverse some of these gains? And I think the place to start when we're asking this question is to look at the interna international context. What was happening uh, outside of Russia and across across Europe at the time. Because if you want to see uh, the biggest break in terms of political perspectives between Stalin and Lenin, look at their international perspectives. Because uh, I'm sure people at school and in history uh, studied Stalin's uh, notion of socialism in one country. Uh, the idea that pe uh, the uh, socialists in Russia should just simply focus on what's going in, on in Russia and build socialism there. Uh, this couldn't be further from the perspective of the Bolsheviks in 1917 to 1920. Uh, from the very beginning, the Bolsheviks were completely committed to a world revolution. They saw the Russian Revolution as one step in a world revolution, in a worldwide series of revolts and uprisings that would shake uh, capitalism to its very core. And one of the key uh, theories to this, really, was Trotsky's theory of permanent revolution. 
I haven't got much time to go into it, but this was basically the notion that in a society that was actually quite backward, like Russia, where you had lots of peasantry and only a small working class, actually the working class could push forward for a socialist revolution <coughs> if the revolution sped outside Russia, and if the Russian working class was assisted by working classes in Germany, in Hungary, in Britain, across Europe, and so on. Also linked to this is Lenin's, peri uh, Len Lenin's theory of imperialism, the idea that capitalism is a global uh, network and that, inter and that all e economies are interconnected and so on. So from the very start, the Bolsheviks identified the fact that the Russian Revolution wasn't alone. It wasn't a revolution in isolation. They saw it as one step in a series of revolutions that would spread across Europe and across the globe. Now, Historians uh, since the revolution have often tried to say uh, that this perspective was a pipe dream, uh, that, the Bolsheviks, that the Bolsheviks were living in a fantasy world if they thought that this would take place. Uh, you know, historians sometimes say that actually the Bolsheviks use this as a later justification for taking power in October 1917. You know, we're told that uh, it, the idea that this was possible is ridiculous. To be, the, uh, the, the reality couldn't be further from that. The reality is that the period of 1916, really through to 1920, 1921, is a period where the whole world caught fire. There were revolts in almost every single mass, uh, 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 advanced capitalist country across Europe. Uh, you had Soviets in Hungary, you had uh, riots in places like Paris, you had the two red years in Italy, even here in Britain in 1919 you had a significant uprising where there were mass strikes, uh, mutinies by the soldiers and so on. And, and there's two quotes that I want to read out um, that I think really sum up the period. The first one is from Victor Serge. Uh, Victor Serge was an anarchist who uh, went to Russia and later joined the Bolsheviks. This is what Serge said about uh, the period from 1916-1917 uh, onwards. He said this, the newspapers of the period are astonishing. Riots in Paris, riots in Lyon, revolution in Belgium, revolution in Constantinople, victory of the Soviets in Bulgaria, rioting in Copenhagen. In fact, the whole of Europe is in movement. Clandestine or open Soviets are appearing everywhere, even in the Allied armies. Everything is possible, everything. So that's a quote from one end of the polit political set spectrum of someone who's a revolutionary. I also want to read out a quote from someone else. I'm sure people studied in history. Uh, David Lloyd George, the British Prime Minister of the time. You know, the, the great liberal British Prime Minister. This is what uh, David Lloyd George had to say <coughs> about the period. He said this. The whole of Europe is filled with the spirit of revolution. There is a deep sense, not only of discontent, but of anger and revolt amongst the workmen against the pre-war conditions. The whole existing order in its political, social and economic aspects is questioned by the masses of the population from one end of Europe to the other. So I think that's something that you never, they never really teach you in history, is the fact that at the time, the Russian Revolution took place in a period of mass social upheaval where the Bolsheviks saw the Russian Revolution as a catalyst for revolution in other countries in other countries out elsewhere. <coughs> and this is something they based their whole political strategy on. And that's actually why, in the aftermath of the Russian Revolution, uh, despite the pressures of the Civil War, despite the collapse, uh, the collapse of the economy, this, uh, the, the new Bolshevik regime spent a lot of time in setting up something called the Common Term, the Third International, which was really set up to set up uh, Bolshevik parties in other countries so that revolutionaries in Germany, in Britain, uh, across Europe, in America and so on, could fight for revolution and try and shape events that were going on there. Now, despite the best efforts of the Third International and the Comintern, uh, none of the other revolutions actually broke through. Uh, a lot of the came, them came very close. Places like Germany came very, you know, got rid of the Kaiser. A lot of them became very close, but none of them got quite got to the level that the Russian Revolution did in terms of Soviets running society. And really the ruling classes were able to see off the challenge of these revolutions. Uh, they did it through a variety of measures, through vicious uh, reaction, through to the betrayal of uh, social democratic parties and parties like the S SDP in Germany and so on. But what, what happens is that you get to a situation where the Soviets are in charge in Russia but the international situation begins to worsen. And this means that the Russian Revolution, 
begins to become increasingly isolated. Uh, it becomes isolated in the fact that it's the only country which revolution actually goes the full way of, of creating a new society, but it also gets isolated in the way in which the Bolsheviks are left alone, really, to fight against the old order. Because, like any revolution in history, uh, the old order don't give up their power easily. Uh, although the Bolsheviks get rid of the Tsar, they get rid of the provisional government, uh, the remnants of that regime, uh, the White Army they're called, uh, you know, the Tsarist generals, the rich aristocrats, and so on, obviously begin, begin plotting and organising against the new Bolshevik regime. And one thing you also don't really learn in your history books is that not just do the old Tsarist generals in Russia begin to organise against the Bolsheviks, but really every major world power sends in armies to crush the revolution. Uh, so 14 or 15 different uh, imperial powers, uh, Britain, <coughs> France, Belgium, send in troops uh, to crush the Bolshevik revolution. <laughs> and what that means is that the new Bolshevik regime, having just uh, established itself as the first society to bring in uh, Soviet power, faces a civil war and faces armies for, uh, uh, from all sides. And not just any old armies, but some of the best equipped armies in the world. So you imagine that while the economy is in absolute chaos, while there's a trade embargo in Russia, while there's absolute famine, the Bolsheviks then have to go on and fight a civil <coughs> war against the White Army and the imperialist powers. And so on the one side, you have the White Army and the imperialist powers, and on the other side, you have the Red Army, uh, which is really made up by the people who led the revolution. Uh, workers volunteering their thousands to go and fight at the front to defend the revolution, peasants, and so on. And so, remarkably, uh, in that situation, uh, it, despite the massive imbalance of forces, remarkably, the Red Army actually succeeds and it beats the White Army. I mean, it's a testament to the dedication to the revolution of the workers from the cities and so on that the Red Army is able to win. But, obviously, this comes at a massive price. Uh, three or four years of civil war uh, in a country in absolute chaos, uh, with famine and, and economic collapse and so on, it, this comes at a terrible price. And what, re what really happens is that not only is industrial production hit badly, not only is there a massive embargo on Russia so that goods can't enter Russia, but what you also see is that the working class begins to, well, basically is decimated by the civil war. Uh, the very people who made the revolution, uh, the people at the heart of the cities, in Petrograd, in Moscow and in other places, have either died at the front defending the revolution or have had to go to the countryside in search of food and so on. So the very basis of the revolution, the epicenters of the revolution, the Soviets and the workers' councils and so on, are really destroyed by three, four years of civil war and the fact that the revolution can't spread internationally. And this is important for us to understand, because it's not just a history lesson, but this is important for us to understand in terms of how it is Stalin is able to rise to power. Because with the working class decimated and destroyed, really you see the party bureaucracy and <coughs> the party apparatchiks really be, be able to become the supreme force in, in Russia. So rather than decisions being made democratically in Soviets and in workers' councils and so on, decisions are really made by the party apparatchiks, the people around Stalin, the bureaucrats, and so on. And that's really why, by 1928, uh, Stalin is able to assume complete control of the, Bolshe of the Communist Party, as the Bolsheviks go on to be called, and is really able to then shape society in his vision which is a vision very different from the one the Bolsheviks had in 1917. It sees Russia uh, really as competing with the West. Uh, in the SWP, we call Russia state, state capital, we call Stalinist Russia state capitalist because you see Stalin really sets up a regime where the most important thing is competing economically with the West. So he brings in the five-year plans, rapid industrialization, and you see that a narrow layer of society at the top of society begin to get rich off it. So this is why we say that rather than there being a straight line between Lenin and the Bolsheviks of 1917 and Stalin, we say that actually Stalin represents a complete counter-revolution, a complete betray betrayal and distortion 
of what the Bolsheviks stood for. And the two reasons why he's able to do that are the context of the defeat of the uh, European revolutions and the decimation of the working class inside Russia. Now, I think it's important we understand these reasons because, like I say, what you're told is that uh, it's, it was absolutely inevitable that as soon as the Bolsheviks took power in October, that it would lead to the secret police and the gulag and the terror of Stalinist Russia in the years later. Actually, there was no straight line between the two. There was a real battle on about which way Russian society would go. The Bolsheviks, led by Lenin and later by Trotsky, the original Bolsheviks of 1917, fought tooth and nail to defend the gains of the revolution. Uh, they fought against the White Army in the Civil War, they fought against the Imperialist armies, and Trotsky, after Lenin's death, fought against the Stalinist bureaucracy. But in the end, uh, the ideals of the Russian Revolution of October were defeated by circumstances, but not because they were ideals which couldn't work on paper, not because they were hopeless ideals which we can't aspire to today. And actually, rather than Lenin leading to Stalin, I think it's more accurate to say that the Bolsheviks were backed into a corner where Stalin could reverse every gain that was ever made by the revolution in October. So where does this leave us today? I think it's important to stress that it's not some abstract uh, theoretical or historical debate to discuss why, uh, whether Lenin led to Stalin, because if we accept what mainstream society says, if we accept what mainstream media says, that Lenin led to Stalin, that there was an inevitable straight line between the two, really, we're accepting the idea that any revolution that challenges society is always uh, going to uh, end in failure. Really, we're accepting the idea that any revolution or any new society will always lead to a Stalin figure, will always lead to betrayal, to terror, to dictatorship, and so on. And if we accept that, then the conclusion is that the only way to fight for a better world is to accept, uh, or really to fight uh, on an acceptable reformist basis, that we should go through the channels that are given to us, through parliaments, through reforms, and so on. And actually, I'm sure we all know that the crisis of capitalism at the moment, from the refugee crisis to the climate crisis, requires a solution on a much greater scale than simple reforms and just taking it through parliament. We know it require, requires a revolutionary perspective and a revolutionary solution. So I think in that sense, the October Revolution is not, we should, we should just reclaim it as our past, but we should also reclaim it as our future and as a weapon to be used in the debates and the struggles that come up in the future. So I'll leave it there.